Hello, my name is Kate Robinson. I am the head gardener here at the Charter House and welcome to our Flower Power Festival. Uh, I'm here with Miko and Charlotte. Just going to quickly say hi. <laughs> and hi. We're bringing you this uh, fabulous festival celebrating the power of flowers for health, happiness and well-being. Um, we're coming to you live from the Charter House. For those of you who don't know about us, we are um, a historic site, seven acres, uh, on the edge of the City of London in Clerkenwell. Um, we were a monastery in the 14th century and since then have been a Tudor mansion, a boys boarding school and an almshouse, which we are to this day. Um, the brothers have enjoyed this garden immensely over lockdown and so we wanted to bring it to you in your homes through this virtual tour. Um, and thank you so much for uh, your donations to watch this film. Everything goes to help the charity here at the Charter House. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to Marianne Morgendorf. She is from Wolves Lane Flower Company and her and her partner Camilla Klitsch run a flower farm in Wood Green, North London. Um, today she's going to be presenting the very useful cutting garden and taking you through how to get the most out of growing your own flowers and enjoying them throughout the seasons. And um, we'll also be joined by Lee Chapel, another florist, who will be uh, asking her questions at the end and building your questions that you've given. Um, so welcome to Marianne. Hi, Kate, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna do that uh, inevitable Zoom thing of checking my volume is fine and everyone can see me. I think so, yes, all good yeah, on our side. Good. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thank you for having me here today. I'm only going to cover um, about 20 minutes of talking today, so I'm going to rattle through some flowers that um, we have um, discovered as, as really brilliant workhorses um, in the cutting garden. Um, I'll give you a brief intro to me and to Wolves Lane Flower Company. Um, we are a micro flower farm based in North London in Wood Green. Um, Camilla and I both worked in different industries pre prior to becoming florists and flower growers. Um, I worked in theatre and Camilla worked in fashion. And um, it's a very long story as to how we got our site, which is um, a 40 metre glass house um, and some outside cutting plots as well. Uh, no time to talk about that in detail today, but um, we have been growing flowers for about three and a half years and um, we grow with a sustainable environmental approach. We use no chemicals and um, uh, the most important thing is that we're seasonal. So um, virtually everything we use in our work and that we sell to florists um, and to um, customers in London, um, are flowers we've grown ourselves, but if ever we bought ever other flowers in, we always um, buy from other British growers and um, work with the seasons. And um, that is something I want to talk about a little bit more today, things that you can enjoy throughout the year, even in winter when it feels like there are no flowers to enjoy at all, that there always is something. Um, and I was really inspired by the title of this flower festival, Flower Power, to just think about how um, flowers are amazingly powerful, um, potent little um, powerhouses, I say power a few more times, um, that I feel like we as, you know, humans have become very uh, distanced from. We don't understand anymore the, the, the things that they do and the, um, the uses that they can have in our lives. And I'm primarily working with flowers as a cut flower for, um, for the floristry we do, but I've in the last couple of years been discovering some of the things that um, it's possible to use them for. So very much a lot of this, I'm coming at it as an enthusiast and as a learner. I don't pretend to be an expert on the te techniques such as drying or pressing. It's something I'm discovering all the time, but I hope by talking you through um, sort of four or five great flowers that um, we love to work with, that you will be inspired to try growing them and also kind of harness the power of them. 
I'm going to run through some of those flowers for about 20 minutes. If you think of any questions you'd like to ask during this time, then just type them in and Lee Chappell um, is going to kind of have a chat with me and um, flag some of those questions. I just felt I wasn't going to be able to look at questions and talk at the same time and I'd completely lose my train of thought. So thank you, Lee, for um, stepping in and valiantly helping. Um, so these are not your Instagram star flowers. These are not the flowers that are um, the peonies and the, the real kind of hard hitters of um, uh, yeah, the, the Instagram world. But I think these are some of the most useful things you can grow for a variety of reasons. I'm gonna, I've got my little show and tell gallery here and I'm gonna start with Borage, which um, is this beautiful blue flower here. Now, Borage is, um, is amazing because every two minutes, this flower refuels its nectar for bees. So if you grow it for no other reason than just because you wanna help bees, then um, this is the flower for you. Sometimes I find that um, people overlook this as a cut flower. And part of that reason is because some of the, the, you get, as it matures, you get this very hairy foliage, which often can get mildewy and doesn't look very nice. So what I did this morning, I don't know how well you can see, um, I, I basically stripped off any of the leaves that weren't looking beautiful and what, what it reveals is the beautiful star flowers that I think within a bouquet is, is just such an exquisite detail to include. It lasts really well as well and as it ages it goes a beautiful pink colour. Um, one of the other reasons why this is such a favourite of mine is at the beginning of the season when we have um, very few things to cut, so this is sort of... Um, what, March, April time, um, the bulbs are just beginning, but we don't have a lot to, to go with those flowers. Borage is always, she always shows up to the party early and just gives you a beautiful texture to, to kind of um, juxtapose with those really beautiful jewel shades of tulips. Um, so this is one that I, also it self seeds. Once you've got it, you've got it forever and you have to do absolutely no work in order to um, get it to come back every year. So this, I would say, is one, if you've never tried growing flowers, grab some borage seeds um, and then your work is done in the cutting garden for the next few years. It's, it's obviously um, another great one to be able to put into salads. You can eat the flowers and um, it is a good one. I'm, I'm told, I haven't tried it myself, but as a natural dye, um, blue flowers often come out a more kind of purpley colour and... Um, there's a whole world of things you could talk about with that, but, but certainly if you wanted to kind of experiment throughout the year with, with dyeing as well, then um, borage is a brilliant one to, um, to grow and to use. So that's top tip number one. Um, I'm then going to talk about calendula, which right now I have this really snappy, bright, punchy variety but there are so many different varieties um, of calendula that you can grow um, like borage this is a hardy annual so you can be sowing this now um, and you'll have flowers next year to enjoy um, we also would sow this in february and um and and probably do a succession later in the year because it's a super fast flower to um to propagate and to to get to flowering stage I would say it's not something that um, lasts a terribly long time in terms of, um, it's a cut and come again crop, but um, it can easily get tired. So you wanna do a succession of flowers so you have lots to enjoy throughout your season. Um, this variety is, um, which is your sort of most traditional of, of marigolds is, is really the best for all those amazing um, additional uses of uh, using, you can, you can seep it in an, um, sweet almond oil and use that as a skin product. You can um, obviously use this in salads and next to the borage, like how beautiful does that look as a, a little salad garnish? I just think um, anyone is going to be impressed if you're including um, petals within a bog standard salad. Um, and obviously this is something we use a lot in our uh, cutting work as well. There are various other shades. There's, um, varieties we love are Indian Prince, 
coffee cream um, or snow princess. They're all kind of slightly more refined, interesting varieties. And you can find those easily from seed companies. The seeds are also a really good size. So if you're a bit um, nervous about seed sowing and you believe you're the sort of person that is not able to um, get anything to grow, calendula, I think, is pretty fail safe. Um, all of our calendula has uh, germinated brilliantly this year when I'm kind of staring at the seed trays and things aren't coming up. Uh, the, the, the calendula never lets me down. So this is definitely one to include in your cutting garden. Um, and this is a self-seeded variety I just went and picked this morning. So again, it's another one that you'll um, be rewarded by um, if, you, if you're happy for your garden to kind of self-sow, um, this will come back um, time and time again. Now, obviously, as a seasonal flower farmer, we don't have flowers blooming beyond the middle of November. Our last crop is chrysanthemums and we grow those under glass, which is an unheated glass house. There's no artificial light. So once those chrysanthemums have, have finished, um, we don't have fresh flowers to work with really until the end of March. So this year we put huge amounts of effort into drying flowers and that's really just air drying. Um, we, we have old staging in our glass house, which is a, a metal grid and we've, we've literally just hung all our flowers from there for them to air dry and I've covered the side in black plastic um, I know the air is ventilating, uh, is circulating underneath to keep those flowers ventilating because your enemy when it comes to drying flowers is poor ventilation. You're more likely to get mold and then you can lose an entire um, harvest of dry flowers in that way. So you can dry flowers um, anywhere that's cool and um, cool but warm, <laughs> doesn't make sense, but uh, not freezing not too hot, just right. And um, uh, that also doesn't get loads of artificial, sorry, loads of um, natural daylight because um, your colors will fade. Now I've got here some, this is one of my proudest dried um, uh, experiments of this year, which is Larkspur. Um, maybe if I hold it against my, <laughs> my tummy, you can see it better. Um, but, this was something um, that was flowering early in the season for us. So I think this was, this was fresh in May. We, we cut it fairly open. So um, it's interesting. I find a lot of um, people are not super keen on blue flowers or purple flowers. Um, we tend to get people that want more of the kind of um, sludgy shades. But really, if you want to work with dried flowers, the vibrant colours, which will always darken and intensify at the point of drying, are really the ones you want to go for. So whilst this was not a popular flower amongst our other Larkspur shades, something like Misty Lavender is a really beautiful one to grow um, fresh. Um, but really, this is, this I would say, is, is kind of your most winning shade for being able to use in um, uh, dried arrangements. And I think a lot of people remember dried work from the 1970s and have an idea in their head about dried flowers feeling a bit fusty. I think that is all, that's all behind us now. And I think we can think about how um, simply just having dried flowers, a single variety in one vase, how cheerful is that to get you through Christmas and the cold, dreary January um, before the promise of new flowers arrives. Um, the colour will fade if it's left somewhere in direct sunlight, but um, I think it's, we can think about it as ageing gracefully. Um, this is also a really easy one to grow from seed. Uh, you have to be a little bit aware of the fact that Larkspur needs a, a period of what's known as cold stratification. So um, what we do is keep it in the fridge for two weeks before we sow it, and then um, it can keep you hanging around for a week or so before it germinates. But that often we get a lot of questions about how do, um, why does my larkspur not germinate? And, and the fridge method is a really good way of overcoming um, its sluggishness. Um, we also press this. Um, 
I'm very new to pressing and I'm certainly not an expert. If you want to look at people who are brilliant at pressing flowers, I would recommend looking at um, the Instagram accounts, Mr. Studio or um, Jam Jar Flowers, but there are hundreds of people doing it. Really all we've done for pressing flowers this year, we're lucky to have a lot of space. So we have um, got two big boards, put um, lining paper, wallpaper lining paper down and, and put our flowers between these two boards and then weighed them down with a lot of bricks and anything we can find. And I found um, essentially squashing the flowers in that manner, as long as it doesn't get too hot, um, we've had brilliant results from that. So um, again, it's the sort of thing that I think many people have, um, have stopped doing, but is another brilliant way of um, having little floral things to enjoy throughout the winter. Um, just putting them within a frame or um, some, something we're trying more and more is using them as little table favors for weddings. Um, that's very popular. So um, Larkspur is because of its beautiful sort of spire-like sculptural shape, um, that is one that, that presses really nicely. You can do it within a book. You don't need to buy an expensive flower press. Um, all you're doing is, is squashing that flower. So um, uh, it's worth experimenting and trying. So um, this is probably the only one I'm talking about that I'm fairly confident you can't eat. So don't put that in the salad um, that you're all going to make later. Um, I'm, I'm fairly sure that's, that's not an edible flower. Um, I've got a tiny, just to talk about pressing a little bit more, I've got a tiny little vase here of, um, these are just um, the kind of native viola or heart, heart seas as it's, um, it's also known. And this is a, we've had really brilliant results pressing this, but um, I'll just show you how the experts do it. We worked with Mr. Studio on um, pressing flowers, I've got that upside down. Um, and they made us these beautiful little greeting cards of all our violas. Um, these were really vibrant colours, so you can see how the colour does fade um, when they're in the process. Anything when flowers are in the process of aging, they do the colour becomes less. It, well, it darkens, but it becomes less um, vibrant. So that's something to think about. But um, violas are a really sweet thing to to enjoy. Um, this is in a tiny bud vase, and again, I just that next to my bed is just such a lovely thing to enjoy also something you can eat and um just uh, i'm not sure how um delicious any of these flowers are in terms of flavor but um really you're just adding them to make your salad look more exciting and more more beautiful um so i would definitely suggest growing violas particularly if you're short on space these are super easy to grow from seeds. You don't need to go to the garden center and buy them. You can buy a packet of seeds and, and have 50 plants, no trouble at all. And um, they will last and flower in a, in a window box for months on end. So I really think this, this is the flower to grow if you have literally no garden at all. You can still have a miniature cutting garden and, um, and enjoy them. Then, the last flower I just wanted to talk about is, um, is the rose. I've got a really uh, showy, blousy pink rose here. I will confess, I don't know the name of this rose. This is one we inherited. Um, and I've cut this incredibly open. So it's, um, it's pretty blousy. The best time to cut a rose though, is it the what well, is is obviously first thing in the morning when your, um, your, your, your stems are turgid. But can you see here how the, the rose, um, the sepals of the rose have, have peeled back, but the, the bud is still um, intact. I think a lot of people think of English roses as a flower that is not a good cutting flower. And that's often because on the bush, they see this and they think, oh, that looks so beautiful. I'll cut that now. And very quickly, everything is falling apart. My table is completely littered with um, pink petals right now. So it's really important that you cut your roses at the, at the right time. Another money saving tip um, is do buy your roses as bare root. Don't, don't be seduced at the garden centre by um, bushes that are um, covered in, in blossoms because you are paying the price for the fact someone has got it looking to that state. 
you want to plant your bare root roses um, anytime from November to um, January is ideal. You can, we actually, because of lockdown, didn't plant ours till March this year, um, but it is preferable to be planting them in the kind of winter dormancy months. Um, roses are obviously something which um, historically have been used hugely for, for skincare, for baking, for um, flavouring. I'm not going to pretend to be someone that has done huge amounts of those things, but the great thing about having a rose is once you have it, you've got it for life. So um, I have a toddler. I don't have a huge amount of time for baking, but I, I know that this is something I can return to in years to come as my rose bulks up and gets happier and healthier. And um, uh, the other thing that people talk about a lot is their worry about pruning a rose. And I would say on the whole, roses are pretty bulletproof and um, Camilla once described them as the Cruella de Vil of flowers. They're, they're pretty hard to kill. So you can hack them back in um, autumn or uh, the end sort of February is another good time in which to prune them. And um, you're just cutting them down to um, to a point where the rose is going to um, be regenerating from um, closer to the ground. Um, it depends if you're having it in a garden context or you're using it in the cutting garden. Um, you just don't want your rose to become huge and unwieldy and woody because it's harder to see those flowers um, at eye line. So do be confident and uh, just go for it with cutting, with pruning a rose. I think it is very hard to um to go wrong um lee i'm gonna suggest maybe so i don't kind of uh talk endlessly that maybe um you might want to come in at this point and um if anyone's asked any questions i'm not sure i haven't been keeping track whether um there's anything that's worth uh um chatting about Definitely, definitely. We have a few questions which are really interesting. So there's a question from Poppy um, asking how you manage pests and mm. prevent them from nibbling at your leaves and blooms. So Poppy, I've had, um, I've had some fairly uh, traumatic times with pests. Uh, as we grow under glass, everything is intensified everything um it is a much more aggressive growing um environment and in the first year we didn't have any well for the first two years in fact we didn't have any irrigation in our glass house so the plants were much more easily stressed you'll always have um a greater propensity to pests when you have um stressed plants and that is if they're not watered enough um uh or are not in the right light conditions for 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 their, their best selves. So um, it's, a, it's a cliche always worth returning to, right plant, right place. And it's always worth watching your plants. I think that's the most important thing um, to be aware of the problem before it spirals out of control and you're then trying to kind of put a sticking plaster on a gushing torrent of aphids. Um, so, what we do is um, we feed our plants probably bi-weekly for the most part and we use a seaweed feed or a comfrey feed. You can make comfrey um, super easily. That's another brilliant one for the cutting garden because um, the bees love the flowers. It's very easy to grow. There's a strain called Bocking 14 that you want to have in your cutting garden. And um, there was recently a brilliant thing on Gardener's World about um, making it and so it doesn't smell by not um, soaking in water you can find out all about that online but feeding your plants keeping your plants watered looking at the plants before the aphid problem or spider mite or whatever it is has got out of control um, you can you know there's all sorts of things people say about garlic sprays chili sprays neem oil sb invigorator they're all things you can try but um the other thing is just to um we had terrible aphids at the beginning of our season. I was like freaking out. We were going to have no roses all year because the aphids were like, um, it was like a plague. And then we had a week of rain and the aphids disappeared. And rainwater is always your, your best weapon for um, hydration and 
keeping your plants happy. So get a water butt, harvest that rainwater however you can, and um, that will always penetrate the soil and have a bigger impact than um, mains water. Great, that sounds wonderful. Um, so there's another question from Ben uh, saying, any rose varieties you'd recommend to start with for a beginner, particularly in a container? Um, I think if you're growing roses for cutting, um, without, I, I'm in, obviously in no way uh, affiliated with them, but you can't go wrong with spending an afternoon looking through the David Austin catalogue. And um, we have, I've just planted rolled dahl in my garden, which I just think is such a beautiful rose. It's a yellowy colour. The shape is beautiful. Um, it's prolific. Um, and that has been a, um, a beautiful addition to the garden. I also have um, Lady of Shallot, which is more like an apricot orange colour. Um, that is incredibly prolific. Um, and the other flower that we cut a lot of and is brilliant because it has um, very few thorns is um, Litchfield Angel, which is a, a kind of white colour. And um, if you're using flowers for, for the home, then um, having to take all the thorns off is, is a pain. So if you start with one that doesn't have a lot of thorns, then that, um, that's, a, that's a help. I know that um, David Austin has, you know, he's done, not him personally, but the company has done a lot of work with um, listing ones that are good for a container. What I would say though is always buy a bigger container than you imagine you'll need. Roses are incredibly um, big and hungry plants and you do need to make sure you've got enough um, energy and time and inclination to feed that rose because um, it will deplete those, um, the goodness in that soil incredibly fast. Um, I, I will confess I'm not a brilliant container garden um, uh, gardener because uh, I, I, I tend to forget about those um, those plants and feeding them. But if that's what, what you have, then um, just get that seaweed feed um, somewhere where you're going to see it every day and remember to feed, feed your roses. Um, but you've got to choose roses that you love. So um, I love those three roses I mentioned, but um, there may be ones that you discover um, that sing to you. And I think you can cut any rose. It's just um, cutting it at the right point and realizing that a rose is never gonna last you um, a week in a vase and that's okay. Trouble is there are too many beautiful ones, aren't there? Really, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh dear, so um, next question. Um, which flowers would you say are actually best for drying and which would you say you definitely shouldn't dry? And that's from um, Annie Sutcliffe. So we've done loads of experimenting this year. We've dried practically anything, um, anything that we've grown. And um, other than Larkspur, which is, is my kind of um, key success of this year, um, Achillea is a lovely one to dry. Um, it is a, it, it's nowhere as beautiful as the fresh, but it, it, it is a lovely texture and um, a kind of um, counter in, in it's that dense shape to something like this. We, grow, we dry a lot of seed heads, poppy, nigella, um, nicotia, uh, not nicotiana, nicandra, um, anything that's sculptural and um, interesting kind of shape wise um, as a seed head or as a grass. So this is um, Panicum frosted, frosted Explosion, which um, I actually prefer in its dried form where it goes a kind of beautiful blonde color. Um, oh, Bells of Ireland is another one that is amazing dries. And we actually leave that in the glass house. So you could leave it next to a windowsill and it, it bleaches out and is just stunning. I'm really excited about this year, that this year. Um, obviously good old lavender is an amazing one for drying as well. Um, that's, that's a really dark purple variety and I've found I've had the best results with, um, I couldn't tell you what variety that is, but when you're buying a lavender, there are so many different varieties, you need to um, keep that in mind that you're going to have best results with one that's this sort of indigo colour versus the um, the paler ones. 
Um, Statis, obviously um, beautiful and um, so many lovely colours out there now to choose from, kind of apricots and um, peachy shades as well as the more traditional blue and whites. Um, so we've dried a lot of Statis this year. Um, things not, not to dry. Um, I think try everything and then you'll discover because we drew, we dried some GMs this year and I actually love what they look like. Um, they sort of now have become like little papery um, kind of sculptural things and I love those. And the same with, we dried poppy seed heads and some of them still had the petals on and I think those look beautiful as well. We're also drying a lot of dahlias this year and um, I'm in, I'm in two minds as to how I feel about the dried dahlia, um, but it is growing in popularity and it's so easy to do. You just, again, you're either hanging it upside down or leaving it in a little bit of water. Um, like that's a common technique for drying a hydrangea, just to leave um, an inch of water and let that flower kind of dry out um, slowly when you, you picked it at a point where it's pretty mature. Um, so dahlias are another one to try. But really anything like a cosmos is going to be no good because it's just so soft and um, and petally. But I really think the only way to to get to know drying is to just hang that stuff up and see. And um, through the trial and error, that's how we've discovered things that work and and things that don't. So experimenting is the key. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. OK, yeah. thank you. Um, and then I've got a question from Soraya saying, um, do you sear your cut flowers to protect their lives? Um, prolong their lives, I'm sorry. Um, to prolong their lives. So we sear things that um, are in the kind of um, what the brilliant American flo um, flower grower um, Erin Benzikin um, Florit describes as wimpy. <laughs> so things that um, when you cut them, they just like look like they're going to um, just peel over and die and that's it. So um, we grow a lot of scented basil. I'm growing a beautiful lemon basil this year. And at the point of cutting that, it looks terrible. But we we recut the stems, put it in um, boiling water for 30 seconds and then plunge it into a deep bucket of cold. Leave it for 24 hours and that comes back brilliantly. The same goes for... Um, Daucus, um, we find, I don't know if it's because we mainly grow it, we've stopped growing any umbellifers outside because we have a terrible problem with carrot root fly. So all of our umbellifers, like Ami, Daucus, um, all, the, all the Amis, um, we grow under glass now. And I don't know if that's because it's incredibly hot in there, but when we cut our Daucus, um, which is otherwise known as wild carrot, that always, the heads droop. So again, um, we sear those and those perk right up. But I don't sear roses. I don't find that um, I need to, um, unless something was looking very sorry for itself. But obviously, I always cut flowers at the right time of day. Never, never in the middle of the day. Um, ha ha. Uh, and uh, I don't sear the majority of things. But if anything is looking sad, it's amazing how quickly that that peps things up. Perfect, perfect. Actually, I remember reading something um, quite a long time ago that Sarah Raven has a whole list of things that you should see and how long for. Yeah. On, um, yeah, on her site. So it, it might be, if anybody's interested, it might be worth looking at that. Um, now then, there's another one here from Francis saying, how long before you need to put your flowers together? Do you cut them and do you put anything in the water? So um, after this, I'm going and making some wedding flowers and I cut all of my flowers yesterday um, in the morning because I want to leave them enough time to rest. So um, I think people worry sometimes that they're, they want to work with their flowers when they're really fresh, so they want to cut them um, they're worried that if, if you leave it for 24 hours, you're, you're losing a day of their life. Well, really, you're giving that flower um, time to recover from the trauma of um, having cut it and removed it from, its, it from the bush it was growing from. So we always cut 24 hours in advance. Um, we cut early in the morning or end of the day if, if that's not possible. Um, 
I don't use anything in the water. Um, people use all sorts of things. Um, we try and stay away from things like bleach. You can put um, white vinegar, sugar in the water, or um, there are various solutions you can you can buy that are, you know from um, florist supplies. But really, you want a clean bucket and um, kind of cool but not freezing water for most flowers. And we find that's perfectly fine. And the other thing is just to keep changing that water. Um, if you've got an arrangement, um, keep changing that water, ideally a daily or every other day. And the other thing that um, an older lady um, who bought flowers from us recently um, told us she was doing was washing the stems of the flowers um, every time she changed the water as well. And um, she sent me a picture a week on and the flowers were still looking amazing. So um, you've got to take the time. Not everyone, we don't have the time often, but I do think that makes a difference to getting the most out of your flowers. If you kind of keep thinking about them as a living thing, even after the point of cutting them um, and um, treat them well. That's, that makes sense actually. And I think some of those solutions sound slightly dodgy actually. Yeah, we don't, we don't always know what's in that stuff and I think um, stick to basics. No, I agree with you. Um, and then there's a question from Mignon asking, um, I've seen green ammy looking flowers. Do you know what these are? Green ammy looking flowers. Um, and I wonder if that's it, whether that's now or whether that's, um, obviously Ami does look fairly green at the point that it's developing, particularly Ami Visnaga can look really green at the point where it's in bud before it fully opens up. Um, there's a whole world of um, umbellifers that grow in the hedgerow like um, Angelica or, um, oh, what's that one called? Alexander's um, uh, or various types of dill and fennel that are in the umbellifer family. But um, the only one you really want to stay steer clear of is um is the uh hemlock family um and you can identify those in in the hedgerow because they've got um purple blotches on the stem so you you just don't want to cut that it is quite poisonous um there's also a particular hemlock that grows in uh streams and rivers called water drop wort, and that i think is like bad news so um, steer clear of that and um, always be a bit careful when you're cutting things um, when you don't know exactly what it is. Um, hogweed can be, uh, I think it is poisonous, but it's the giant hogweed that's again really problematic. Um, so you're very welcome to um, Instagram me a picture of this flower and I can try and ID it. But um, the only thing that really springs to mind is whether it's the Ami Visnaga at a um, kind of more immature stage, it could be that. I don't know, Lee, if you, can you think of anything else? The only, the only thing that crossed my mind was whether um, she'd seen them earlier and they were uh, cow parsley. Yeah. The only thing that crossed my mind. Yeah. Maybe that. But um, so another question from Francis saying, which hardy annuals are you sowing now? Well, a lot. <laughs> uh, Cornflower, Ami, Calendula, um, Larkspur, Nigella, Snapdragons, um, everything, lots of grasses. Um, because we have the glass house, we are sometimes able to get away with things that um, might not be so happy outside. Um, there's a beautiful hardy annual called Argentine Forget-Me-Not. It's not super tall, but it's beautiful. Um, it's little white exquisite flowers and um, brilliant for wedding flowers. Also, as it develops, the seed head is just beautiful. And we use that a lot in um, buttonholes. Um, it's another great one for your kind of dry, dried store. So if you miss the flowery moment, leave it for the, um, the seeds to develop. Um, that has germinated really easily for us as well. So um, I, I would say that's a more unusual one you can try if you, um, you want to go beyond the kind of um, standard uh, Ami cornflower brigade. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's really unusual or interesting. Um, Sappy glossus is a lovely one as well and black trumpet with very very dark flowers. Again quite a short one but with 
with most short flowers, if you, if you keep cutting them, often you get longer stems. Um, but at the same time, there is only a kind of finite number of hardy annuals. So um, sometimes I spend ages looking through these seed catalogues and then I have to kind of finally go, yep, just still those, still those same flowers. <laughs> Yeah, it is, it's, there's just so much. It's like looking, going into a sweet shop really, isn't it? Just yeah, and always new varieties coming out. And um, I guess we always just try and look around as well and see what has self-seeded. So the, I've got probably, if anyone needs any borage, I mean, I've got about a thousand seedlings growing in um, my paths at Not the moment. some borage. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Viper's Bugloss is another really beautiful one that um, the bees love. Um, it's not the world's most refined cut flower, but I do think there's always a place for those kind of wild and weedy things within arrangements. Um, and again, will self seed really prolifically. So um, that's a, I know garden, again, not an ad, but Gardens Illustrated are giving away free packet of seeds this, uh, this month with them. So if you want some, get the magazine. <laughs> wow, brilliant. brilliant. Um, so we've come to the end of the questions. So um, thank you so much, Marianne. That was absolutely lovely. I so enjoyed that. And thank you. It's nice to see some familiar faces. And um, yeah, this is just a taster, really. But um, you uh, always worth um, having a go and um, spending the time with those flowers over the year and seeing what you can do with them. Perfect. I think All right. we have to Kate? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was great. Um, really, really fascinating. Really interesting. I mean, I made a few notes, <laughs> which is really handy. Um, so, um, thanks, Marianne and Lee, and uh, thank you all for watching. Um, I hope you're booked into other events and the Flower Power Festival. And um, have a look at uh, the Wolves Lane Flower Company website and Instagram and Lee's website and Instagram. And um, also have a look at our, uh, the Charterhouse website and follow us on uh, social media, Instagram and Twitter to find out other things that are gonna be going on beyond the Flower Festival. And thank you very much. <laughs>